So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the opening press conference of the 2018 Sustainable Development Impact Summit. I'm Terry Toyota, member of the Executive Committee of the World Economic Forum. So just a little bit about the format that we'll follow today. Um, after a brief introduction about the summit, um, I will introduce our co-chairs, uh, look to them to speak for a few minutes about their role, um, give us some reflections about being a co-chair for the summit. Uh, then following that, I will open up the floor for questions, try and take uh, a couple at a time, um, and look to the panelists for their response. I, I would ask that you keep your questions to the theme of the conference, um, as I'm sure there's an opportunity to follow up for individual uh, conversations about their in, uh, individual organizations or um, portfolios as you see fit. So thanks for sticking to the theme of the conference in your questions. Um, in addition to the audience, I should mention that this will be live streamed and we do have an audience of over 10 million now on social media. So um, please do know that this is being widely cast. Last year we had over 500,000 hits and views on the opening press conference. So uh, the message is being sent there well beyond uh, the room this morning. So thank you. So we're particularly excited about this year's uh, summit. It's to, designed to be a very unique platform. So this year we'll be spotlighting 100 coalitions that we think are the best examples of public-private cooperation. And we're bringing everyone together to actually look at how we can build out and expand each one of those coalitions as we think this is the best way to meet uh, the sustainable development goals and the global challenges that we face leading up to 2030. It's really much more than just a meeting. It's a, an opportunity, a network, a platform for how we think the, um, new models of partnership need to form. It's a new way of collaboration. And as the International Organization for Public private cooperation, at the forum we really believe it's our responsibility to try and you know, shine a light and spotlight some of these best examples. And our co-chairs are very much leading the way on some of these initiatives and uh, showing this new form of collaboration. Uh, today I'm, I'm honored to be joined by our co-chairs and a Schwab Foundation um, Social Entrepreneur Awardee. So let me introduce them. Uh, we've got Prime Minister Lars Loke Rasmussen, Prime Minister of Denmark. We've got Barbara Novik, Vice Chairman of uh, BlackRock. Sunil Barty from Barty Enterprises, Chairman. And uh, Brukti Tigabo. Uh, and she is the CEO and founder of WizKids. And we'll hear, learn much more about each of their portfolios. Let me start with uh, the Prime Minister. Um, you've been leading many global and national partnerships, really, I think, demonstrating and championing this new form of collaboration that we hope to, to see today. Tell us a little bit more about why it's an important role for you to be a co-chair of this year's Sustainable Development Impact Summit. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm pleased to say a few words about that. But first of all, I would like to thank um, the top, uh, World Economic Forum for organizing this uh, summit. To me, uh, the Sustainable Development Impact Summit is a unique platform for exactly that, sharing best practices, inspire to action, and to be inspired, so I'm looking very much forward uh, to this. And I'm delighted to be co-chairing the event. It underlines the strong uh, collaboration between Denmark and, and the World Economic Forum. And I also think it, it demonstrates that Denmark is ready not only to participate, but also to lead and to act. And action is exactly what we need. And this is why uh, I am pleased to share Denmark's know-how on the power of uh, partnerships, so to speak. Because if we are to deliver on the Paris, Paris uh, Climate Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals, we need to bring actors together in, in new ways, show that sustainable development is also good business. In fact, as I see it, the partnership notion embedded in Sustainable Development Goal number 17 is the key to unlocking the rest of the 16 uh, goals. Um, and I'm pleased to say that Denmark, um, along with seven other countries, have uh, spearheaded the creation of a new global uh, initiative, partnership initiative, called 
Partnering for Green Growth and the Global Goals 2030, or simply P4G. Uh, together, we will facilitate market-driven public-private partnerships within key economic areas to deliver on the Paris Climate Agreement and on the Sustainable Development Goals. And this approach, I think, holds an enormous potential. Um, Denmark has shown by example that it is possible uh, to become greener and richer at the same time. <coughs> on, on windy days in Denmark, all of our electricity is produced by windmills. And we are well on the way to reach our goal of net zero emissions by 2050. So I hope that we can help other partners and, and countries to follow the same path. Uh, and I'm pleased that uh, the World Economic Forum have uh, partnered up with, with, with Denmark and the P4G initiative. And uh, I'm so delighted that we will host the first P4G summit in Copenhagen next month. And I hope to see many of, of you there. So, but right now, we are right here, uh, taking action as well, and I hope we have a productive and inspiring meeting uh, today. So, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks, thanks to you, and we'll hope for more windy days in Denmark. Great. Barbara, let me turn to you now. Um, I think, you know, Larry Fink's famed call-out, let's say, to CEOs earlier this year uh, really started to push forward that, that trend that we're seeing amongst business. Um, and I know there's now quite an investment in investor stewardship going forward or how to engage publicly listed companies in kind of this value creation for the longer term. You can tell us more about that and why and how you're using this role as a co-chair to try and promote that agenda. All right. Thank you, Terry, and, and thank you for inviting me to be a co-chair. Um, I think all of us share as a general theme that we want to leave a better world for our children and our grandchildren. I don't have grandchildren yet, but someday, um, <laughs> hopefully soon. <laughs> don't tell my daughter that. <laughs> um, but in, in all seriousness, I think you know, BlackRock as an asset manager does have an opportunity to lead in this area. And I think you know, when you think about our overall theme as a company, our objective is to create good financial futures for our clients, and um, some of them are intermediaries for their end clients. And we look at the sustainability, where can we make an impact? I would break it into four different areas. Um, one is to offer products, and we actually are one of the leaders in sustainable products, whether it's ETFs, it's mutual funds, it's private funds, wind power, um, you know, low carbon, all sorts of things across the spectrum, um, and offering products in different markets in ways that clients can buy them if they choose to allocate their assets that way. Um, the second is in both using data and encouraging data. So to be able to make good investment decisions, you have to be making it on real information. And that is a nascent part of the industry. Um, it is improving, it's, it's certainly getting better, but it's something that we have focused a lot of resources on Gaining, getting data, improving data, and also doing research on the data to show how you can use this in positive ways in portfolios. The third is what you mentioned, the stewardship. And you know, we look at stewardship as a fiduciary role. We're looking to maximize value in client portfolios. And if you think about the long-term value, a company that is in business 10 and 15 and 20 years from now, that's a very important component. Larry's letter addressed, he called it a new engagement model. Um, and the concept for us is when you look at the assets we have under management in the equity space, 90% of those are in index funds. We follow the index. We're going to own that company whether we like the business they're in or not, whether we like the management or not, we're going to still own it. So the best way we can encourage change is through engagement yeah. and our voting. So you know, this is a very important focus for us. Uh, we've already increased the team this year. We're going to continue to increase the team for a while going forward, um, both resources on the technology side, but also resources on the people side. And then the fourth pillar of, of sustainability is how do we run our own company? And people don't talk about that enough in the asset management space, and I think it's a question that people should be asking. Yeah. So we're not in the manufacturing business. We don't have some giant you know, manufacturing facility that's some energy pig, but we run data centers 
data centers are actually very large energy users. We have designed <coughs> data centers to be very energy efficient and to use hydropower. So that's a, a way we can contribute ourselves. Um, e here in the U.S., there's a penchant for delivering paper to people. And until recently, the SEC required that we deliver reams and reams of paper to mutual fund holders. And we lobbied very hard to get what's called e-delivery. So basically, we can d deliver that same information electronically, which is probably the way the consumers prefer it. And if they don't, they can ask for paper. So they've made it, the default is now going to be electronic. It'll take a little while to kick in. But that, to me, is just such an, an obvious environmental <coughs> issue, and yet one that, if we didn't push hard, would continue to waste, waste trees, waste paper, et cetera. Um, so you know, I think looking at how people are running their own company, how they're using their resources and, and their influence to make changes beyond you know, their borders, I think, is a very important component. And again, one that's not really talked about enough. Right, right. Well, it's a very comprehensive program, and I think a real be bellwether for other institutions, given you are, the, you know, the largest asset management company. So thank Hopefully you. Hopefully we can lead a little bit. <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks for leaning in. And on that note, uh, Sunil, you, you have responsibilities beyond uh, the chairman of RT Enterprises with GSM, GSMA um, as the chairman also of ICC. Tell us about how you're using those roles and how that marries up with uh, this role on the, as being a co-chair. Well, you know, I'm here really in my um, capacity as the uh, co-chair of uh, this summit, which is an important summit. In fact, uh, an important point in our lives to stop and assess where we are going in terms of uh, the impact of SDGs and how SDGs are uh, being uh, fueled further, accelerated. I also wear two other hats. Uh, I'm the chairman of GSMA, the worldwide telecom technology body, uh, which has all the operators uh, of the world, uh, mobile operators and other tech companies. And I'm uh, now the honorary chair of International Chamber of Commerce headquartered in Paris. All these um, uh, bodies are deeply engaged uh, with the UN uh, on the SDGs. And um, in fact, uh, tomorrow, GSMA uh, will be coming out with an impact assessment report of how technology is uh, firing up the SDGs uh, agenda to ensure that there is a near enough timely completion of the same. Uh, we are monitoring a number of issues there. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, the other part that I represent is from being from the emerging world mm -hmm. as opposed to the developed world. So I had a different lens, the way we look at the issues, our limitations, our needs. And uh, if I give you some uh, data points which have been uh, considered success, that would be in sub-Saharan Africa, where child mortality rate has come down by 35%. Under five, uh, child mortality rate has come down as dramatic as 50%. India, which has been making progress, uh, we have had a reduction of ch uh, child uh, in infant mortality at 7.5%. Uh, uh, more or less all of South Asia, where we had uh, lots of issue of uh, forced uh, uh, girl-child being married away. There's a huge amount of uh, movement there, and we are seeing a significant drop in uh, um, uh, girl-child uh, marriages. Parents are themselves now ensuring that the uh, girls are attaining the right age, legal age, before they get married. So there are a number of good things happening out there. Uh, India has taken upon itself, um, uh, picking up the Prime Minister, the big uh, uh, climate change agenda. Although India, as you know, for 10, 15 years have been saying about equally a differentiated treatment, because India hasn't had the chance to exploit nature, but it took upon a leading role in France. And today, Prime Minister Modi is leading the International Solar Alliance. And India is committed to go above 200 gigawatts of solar power within the shortest possible time frame. And more and more solar energy is being delivered at half the price of uh, grid power in India. It's been a remarkable achievement. The same happens around the wind. Issues of concern that um, uh, agitate my mind is really, are we moving fast enough? Yeah. Yeah. I personally think uh, there is a uh, too much restlessness out there. People are young, especially in countries like India, Bangladesh, Africa, and they were, they're not going to wait forever. Yeah. And therefore, you are seeing some stress in the society as well. So one is that, are we moving fast enough? The second part is, are we putting enough money at work mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that uh, we can achieve the SDGs? Uh, the answer to both of them are perhaps no. 
we need to uh, accelerate our program. There are over $300 trillion of financing in various forms and shapes. How do you focus those finances towards the needs of uh, SDGs, especially in those uh, countries which need it the most? So there, are, there is a uh, you know, very large agenda out there. The hope comes from my other hat that I wear of uh, GSMA. Technology will be able to accelerate the process. Uh, today, there are more than a uh, quarter million education apps. So if you have to educate the society, the only and the fastest way is not to build more universities and schools, which should be done in any case, but you have to go through the digital medium of uh, putting out education uh, in the hands of uh, uh, the people at large. Uh, smartphones are now down to $50. They're powerful computers in your hands. You can do a variety of things on these uh, phones and uh, take up uh, the benefits of the same. Same happens in healthcare, uh, agriculture. I mean, I can keep on naming so many sectors which will benefit, which are directly linked to reduction of poverty, increasing education, climate issues. All of them can, can be supported. So I'm here to lend my voice both on behalf of uh, my region, emerging markets, Africa and India, where I operate, GSMA and ICC. And of course, there are very um, uh, old uh, person who's been involved with the WEF uh, activities. I co-chaired the uh, Davos Forum in 2007 and have been deeply engaged with this activity. Great. Look forward to that continued engagement. So finances, technology, but we need to be moving much faster. So great messages. And then I turn to, to Brookti. You really are the, you embody turning an idea into action. You have a national program that reaches five million children uh, every week in, in Ethiopia. You're like the Sesame Street of Ethiopia. Tell us a little about that journey. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. It's really an honor to be uh, asked to take, uh, you know, in this uh, to take part in this session with co-chairs um, of this uh, summit. Uh, I started out to as a primary school teacher in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and I quickly realized that you know, without public kindergarten, my students were entering school at age seven already at the disadvantage to children their age in other parts of the world. In a country where one third of the population is illiterate, it's heartbreaking to see that children are dropping out in primary school, not dropping out of education in college or high school, but primary school. So I had to find a way to change that. I didn't have money to create kindergarten in every corner of the country. So I was inspired by um, the like of Sesame Street to see the television could contribute to early childhood education uh, on a massive scale. So I had, but I had no idea how to create television program, editing, or anything like that. But my husband and I turned our socks to puppets and our living rooms to production studio. Um, we launched the first educational television program in the country that's called Sahai Loves Learning. It's a giraffe family which educates children about science, health, reading, and character development. We are now reaching about 5 million children every week on national television, re delivering quality education for more than 10 years. Our videos and books are being integrated in a school system in Addis Ababa and expanding throughout the regions. So the road to making an impact as a social enterprise is never easy. I have been turned away hundreds of times by well-meaning partners because I run a social enterprise and not a non-profit organization. Before I was even asked what kind of impact I'm making in my community, I was turned away because I don't take one of the boxes on a form. If we are fo focusing on impact, we need to put impact first. I'm excited to be in this press conference in part particularly because we can't not achieve the sustainable development goals without a gross, grassroots movement from within our community. If I were to say one thing about what I would like to see achieved in this summit, it is an increased awareness of the need to find local champions of the issue we hope to address on the ground within the communities we are working with. We need to connect local champions who are filled with creativity, drive, and vision with influential leaders like those in this room. I'm encouraged by increase uh, in donors like UCID working with local organizations, including social enterprise in my country, Ethiopia, but it does not come easy. 
local champions to change within their community are often not ready or equipped to deal with the bureaucracy required and working with the large scale government donors. External organizations have to be committed to work through the challenge of working with local champions. When those efforts fail, we have to keep trying. We can't give up. We have to ask those local champions who, whose, what pro aspect of the process are strain on them and learn how to transform ourselves into effective partner for local champions. Just as much as local champions need to transform themselves into effective partners for outside organization. And all the amazing topics are on our schedule over the next two days. We need to remember to reflect, do we have the voice of local champions with a drive and purpose to work within the community we are targeting? We need to listen and persevere and be ready to change not just our procedures and expectation, but our vision. Empowering local champion to lead the way means that we must be ready to follow. Are we ready to embrace a new structure that drive impact such as social enterprise? Are we ready to scale that impact and innovations? Are we, are women and youth at, at the center of our design? So the way I see it, the path for making sustainable impact is to connect the passion and vision on the grassroots level to the powerful and influential uh, present in this room. Thank you. Thank you, that's a very inspiring story and you absolutely gave the right call out to what we need to do, do to take this all forward. Great, so let me uh, turn to our, our audience. Uh, yes, please state your name and affiliation and again a reminder to keep to the topic of the summit. Yep. It's coming, thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Irene Hell. I report for Newspeak Middle East and Copenhagen Post. I'm delighted to see three of the biggest champions of the SDG goals, and I tell you why. So you, Ms. Novik, um, you BlackRock is uh, probably the most powerful player when it's come to divestment movement, which is about six trillion now. Do you have any updates about uh, your own assets uh, shifting from uh, fossil fuels to green, and how your statement said um, we should go zero to neutral influenced all the other power pro powerhouses in the financial world. And now I come to you, Prime Minister. Um, Denmark, 2050, you'll be uh, climate neutral, and you're still rich and happy and prosperous. Um, so um, the usual argument is it's too expensive. We, don't, we only have deaths in our countries um, we can't afford to save the environment. Uh, tell me please a little bit more about your partnerships. And now Mr. Mittal, so a legend <laughs> in India. Um, it's amazing that you're not just taking care of your own companies, but you have this new hats going. Can you please tell me um, how uh, Bharti um, fueled the Indian economic miracle? And how you know, you talked about technology, uh, having technology uh, mitigating the SDG goals. So how can technology help with um, SDG goal education? How can the technology help? Now, India is in much better shape, I think, also thanks to your brave statement, um, investing in mobiles. How, how is your own company helping with education? And how can Africa be helped out? Thank you. Okay. It's cool quite a suite of questions while you ponder your, your answers. Um, are there any other questions that, that folks would like to table? Okay. Well, let's start with those. Um, Barbara, I think, you know, really the question was about um, how are you bringing this inside? Um, then we'll turn to the Prime Minister on uh, green economy, how are these partnerships, and then to Sunil on technology. So I think a very important clarification is while we manage quite a bit of assets, none of them are BlackRock's assets. All of the assets we manage are on behalf of clients. So the, we call it asset owners versus asset managers. And it's very important that the asset owners shift because we can't invest in things they don't want us to invest in. 
Um, we are seeing a shift in allocations. Uh, there is an increased interest in all different kinds of sustainable mandates. That includes green bonds. It includes actually green cash now. Um, so whether it's wind power, we have some specialty products in that area, or it's more traditional types of portfolios with a tilt towards sustainability. Uh, we have things across the spectrum. We feel our job is to bring those products to market, make it available, educate investors on why these are good for their portfolio. But at the end of the day, they have to make that allocation. Uh, we believe that as millennials age, you're going to see an increase in the acceleration of that trend. Um, but that would be an important component to getting to where people want to get. Great. Thank you. Prime Minister. Well, uh, let me be brief. I mean, you're absolutely right that uh, we are a living example of the fact that you can combine economic growth and sustainability. And I think uh, since I was a child, Denmark is, in terms of prosperity, I think we have doubled our wealth. Um, and at the same time, we haven't increased our emission at all. And, and that is due to investing heavily in, uh, in uh, renewables. In, and, and, and I mean, the working method has been partnerships, and we have many examples. District heating could be such an example, combining regulatory framework with uh, investments in research and private investments, etc., uh, have led to a situation where many, many private households um, are linked to this uh, district heating, which makes it much more easier to, uh, to go green, uh, because uh, then it's not household from household from household, but we can invest in, the, in, the, in offshore wind farms, etc., and create the heating by these kind of uh, resources. And I think what we can offer now is to, to take these uh, uh, um, lessons learned to other countries, and the idea behind P4G is exactly that bringing uh, C40, the network of the biggest megacities in the world, WEF, uh, private companies, civil society and countries together. Uh, and that's what we are going to do in, at, at this summit next week. And it will be very concrete. It's not about talking. We have established a secretariat in Washington and we have had a global reach out for uh, uh, partnerships. People could, we allowed people to apply. And I think we have received more than 400 or something like that uh, applications. Uh, unfortunately, the funding is not, uh, you know, uh, we, we cannot afford to, 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 to support 400 uh, projects, but we have selected 25 uh, very concrete projects uh, worldwide, which we are going to announce in, in, in Copenhagen. And they are, to some extent, built on the Danish experience. Very good. Well, I mean, India has uh, taken upon technology uh, in the early 90s, and we were all very fortunate that India decided to break the state uh, monopoly of the uh, telecom sector and hand it over to private sector. Lots of companies have come and developed uh, mobile platforms and technology platforms, which are truly helping the society at large. India has nearly a billion connections now, and uh, the uh, pricing or uh, affordability is perhaps the best in the world. For less than $2 a month, you get one gigabyte a day. There's no place in the world which can give you those kind of um, tariffs. Um, it is because of the scale that India enjoys. Mm. Uh, we are putting about 120 million, which is 10 million a month of new smartphones into the market. Uh, out of a billion connection, nearly 350 million are smartphones. And uh, more or less in the next two or three years, almost everyone will have a smartphone in their hand. And as I said, it's a very, very powerful computer. And with that, you can then ensure that people in the deep rural India or villages can uh, use their phones to uh, do a variety of things, and more importantly, education and healthcare activities. Companies like mine also do physical activities. We have over 300 schools in villages, which are our foundation activities. We have over 300,000 little children uh, who are given free education, midday meal, uniform, a computer in school. So I think uh, most of the corporates in um, emerging markets are realizing that it's important to have a society which is uh, one day hopefully be like your society, Prime Minister. We have uh, probably decades to go there, given the extreme poverty that uh, our countries face. But technology is the solution to my mind. Yeah, you've got to start soon. All right, unfortunately our, our time is up. Thank you all very much. Thank you for being co-chairs. This has just been a bit of a trailer to two days, 40 sessions. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.